In this lesson, we're going to talk about algebra formulas, formulas that you're most likely to encounter in a typical algebra course. The first equation is the distance formula. Now, there's two types that you're going to encounter. The first one, d is equal to rt. The distance is equal to rate multiplied by time. In physics, it looks like this, d is equal to vt or displacement is equal to velocity multiplied by time. Now, if you want to calculate the distance between two points, let's say you have point A and point B, and you're given the coordinates of those two points, you can calculate the distance between the two points using this formula. So the distance is going to be the square root of x2 minus x1 squared plus y2 minus y1 squared. Now, let's say if you want to find the midpoint between points A and B. The midpoint, you could find that using the midpoint formula. The coordinates of the midpoint is going to be the average of the x values and the average of the y values. So that's how you can find the coordinates of the midpoint between points A and B. Now, let's say we have a triangle where this is A, B, and C. The next formula you need to be familiar with is the Pythagorean theorem. The hypotenuse C is equal to or c squared is equal to a squared plus b squared. Now, when dealing with triangles, you need to be able to calculate the area of a triangle. The area of a triangle is 1 half base times height. When dealing with circles, the area is pi r squared. The circumference is 2 pi r. The radius is the difference, I mean, it's the distance between the center of the circle and any point on a circle. The diameter is twice the value of the radius. Now, the equation of a circle is this, x minus h squared plus y minus k squared is equal to r squared. In that standard form, the center of the circle has the coordinates h comma k and r is the radius of the circle. Next, we have a rectangle with a length and a width. The perimeter of the rectangle is 2L plus 2W. The area of the rectangle is length times width. For squares with side S, the area of a square is S squared, the perimeter is 4s. The perimeter is the distance around the object. Now the next thing we're going to talk about is the simple interest formula. There's simple interest and there's compound interest. The simple interest is equal to the principal times the annual interest times the time in years. Now, for compound interest, here's the formula. The future amount or the future value is equal to the principal times E raised to the interest rate times T. And T is in years as well. E is a special number. It's 2.718.28 and some other numbers after that. To find the exact value of E, uh, you could use a calculator and just type in inverse natural log. It'll give you the exact value of E, which is 2.718281828, and it repeats. Now, let's talk about linear equations. This is a very common topic in algebra. So there's three forms in which you can write a linear equation. 
The first one is standard form. AX plus BY is equal to C. The next one is in its slope intercept form. Y is equal to MX plus B. M represents the slope. B represents the Y intercept. And then there's the point slope formula. Y minus Y1 is equal to M times X minus X1. So those are the three common equations that you'll use if you want to write linear equations. Now to calculate the slope between two points, it's the change in Y, Y2 minus Y1 divided by the change in X. So it's rise over run. The slope formula is very similar to the average rate of change formula. To calculate the average rate of change, it's the change in y, or f of x2 minus f of x1, divided by the change in x. The average rate of change formula is the same as the slope formula. The average rate of change gives you the slope of the secant line. A secant line is a line that touches two points on a curve. A tangent line only touches one point on a curve. Now let's move on to the formulas associated with quadratic equations. Let's say you have a quadratic equation in standard form and it's set to zero. So we have ax squared plus bx plus c is equal to zero. If we want to calculate the value of x, we could use the quadratic formula. It's negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all divided by 2a. The discriminant is b squared minus 4ac. It's the stuff inside of the square root. If the discriminant is positive, if it's greater than zero, that means you have two real solutions. If it's equal to zero, you have one real solution. If it's less than zero, or if it's negative, that means you have two imaginary solutions. The imaginary number i is equal to the square root of negative one. So anytime you get a negative value inside of a square root, you're dealing with imaginary numbers. Now sometimes you might have an, a quadratic equation written in vertex form. So y is equal to a times x minus h squared plus k. In vertex form, the coordinates of the vertex of the parabola is h comma k. So let's say you have a graph that looks like this. This is the parabola. Here's the vertex. This is h. This is k. This is also the axis of symmetry. You could find the axis of symmetry using this formula. It's negative b over 2a. But this works if the quadratic equation is in standard form. If it's in vertex form, the axis of symmetry is simply going to be x equals h. So you just got to look at whatever this number is. If it's in standard form, then use this formula to get the axis of symmetry. Now let's talk about formulas associated with factoring. So let's say you have a difference of two squares, a squared minus b squared. To factor it, it's gonna be a plus b times a minus b. Now let's say you have a difference of two cubes, a cubed minus b cubed. To factor it, it's gonna be a minus b times a squared plus a b plus b squared. If you have the sum of two cubes, instead of a minus b, it's going to be a plus b, and then it's going to be a squared, but instead of plus a b, it's minus a b, and then plus b squared. Now, if you have a perfect square trinomial, a squared plus 2ab plus b squared, to factor it, it's simply going to be a plus b squared. So those are some formulas to know when you're factoring algebraic expressions. Now the next thing we need to talk about are powers and exponents, particularly the rules associated 
with these. So first, multiplication. If you multiply two variables, variables of the same kind but with different exponents, you need to add the exponents. So a to the m times a to the n is a to the m plus n. So for instance, x to the third times x to the fourth, that's going to be x to the 3 plus 4, which is x to the seventh. When you're dividing variables, you need to subtract the exponents. So this is going to be a to the m minus n. So if we have x to the 9 divided by x to the 4, this is going to be x to the 9 minus 4, which is x to the 5. Now, when you raise an exponent to another exponent, you need to multiply the two exponents. So x to the third raised to the sixth power, this is going to be x to the third times six, or three times six, so that's x to the 18th. If you have a negative exponent, you can make it positive by moving the variable to the bottom. So x to the negative four is one over x to the four and 1 over x to the negative 5 is x to the 5. So whenever you move the variable from the top to the bottom, it's going to change sign. Or if you move it from the bottom to the top, it will also change sign. Now anything raised to the 0 power is 1. So if you have x squared y to the third raised to the 0 power, that's going to equal 1. Now let's move on to the property of logarithms. Log a raised to the x, you can move the x to the front. This is equivalent to x times log a. Log a b, you could separate that into the sum of two logs. It's log a plus log b. log a over b, you could break that into the difference of two logs. It's log a minus log b. Now the next formula we need to talk about is the change of base formula. Log b of a, this is equal to log a over log b, and there's going to be a new base c. And that could be any number. It could be 7, it could be 5, it could be 12. It, will, it doesn't matter what number you choose, it will be the same. So for instance, let's say we have log 5 of 9. This is going to be log 9 over log 5. The new base, I can make it anything. I can make it 24 if I want to. And it will still be accurate. So that's the change of base formula. As we can see, the base was changed from 5 to 24. Now let's talk about variation. There's direct variation, and then there's inverse variation. And let's talk about the formulas associated with this. So for direct variation, we have the formula y is equal to kx. For inverse variation, it's y is equal to k over x. You could also write this as y times x is equal to k. k is the constant of variation. In direct variation, when x goes up, y goes up. For inverse variation, when x goes up, y goes down. So for direct variation, you have a graph that looks like this. It's a linear relationship. For inverse variation, where y is equal to k over x, it looks like that. Now let's talk about arithmetic and geometric sequences. Let's go over some formulas for these two concepts. Now when you have an arithmetic sequence, the numbers increase by a constant amount. So in this case, the common difference is 3. The numbers are increasing by 3. You have to add 3 to get to the next number. For a geometric sequence, it's different. You 
Notice that to get the next number, you need to multiply by 3. So you get a common ratio called R. So R is 3 in that case. A1 is the first term. So here, A1 is 2, A2 is 5, A3 is 8, A4 is 11. To find the nth term, it's equal to the first term plus n minus 1 times the common difference. For geometric sequence, to find the nth term, it's equal to the first term times the common ratio raised to the n minus 1. Now, if you want to find the sum of a certain set of terms, it's going to be the first term plus the last term. And then it's divided by 2 times the number of terms. For geometric sequence, it's going to be the first term times 1 minus r raised to the n over 1 minus r. Now, if you have an infinite geometric sequence, particularly when r is less than 1, you can calculate the sum of an infinite ge geometric sequence using this formula. Basically, you just get rid of this part. But this only works if the absolute value of r is less than 1. So instead of the numbers increasing, they should be decreasing when r is less than 1. Now, to calculate the arithmetic mean, there's a difference between the arithmetic mean and the geometric mean. The arithmetic mean of two numbers is simply the average of those two numbers. It's the sum of the two numbers divided by 2. The geometric mean of two numbers is the multiplication of the two numbers. And instead of dividing it by 2, you need to take the square root, which has an index of 2. So this is how you calculate the arithmetic mean, and that's how you calculate the geometric mean. Now, going back to our previous example, where we had this particular arithmetic sequence. If we calculate the arithmetic mean of these two numbers, it will give us the middle number. So 2 plus 14 divided by 2. 2 plus 14 is 16 divided by 2 is 8. Now, if we were to extend this, and let's say we want to find the arithmetic mean of 2 and 20, it'll give us the middle number. 2 plus 20 is 22. 22 divided by 2 is 11. Now, for a geometric mean, it works the same way. So let's say we have the numbers 2, 6, 18, 54, and then 54 times 3, that's 162. So let's say we want to find the geometric mean of 2 and 162. It will give us the middle number, 18. So if we take the square root of 2 times 162, 2 times 162 is 324, and the square root of 324 is 18. So the arithmetic mean gives you the middle number of the two numbers in which you were looking for the arithmetic mean of. Same thing for the geometric mean. The geometric mean of two numbers will give you the middle number in a geometric sequence.